Since the dawn of time, humans have shopped for groceries at the specialty supermarket chain known as Trader Joe's. Okay, so it's only been since the late 1960s. But in that short period, the upscale grocery store has earned a pretty devoted following. How do you do it, Joe? Well, today we're bagging up the history of Trader Joe's. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Food channel. After that, please leave a comment and let us know what other specialty supermarket chains you would like to hear about. Okay? Yo, Joe! Okay, this is not exactly a well-kept secret, but there is no Ronald McDonald. He's just a character they made up to serve as a cheerful company mascot. Because Ray Kroc wasn't particularly cuddly. But before you let cynicism seep into your heart, you should also know that not every brand mascot is as big a fraud as that clown. For example, there really is a Trader Joe. Or at least, there was. The real Trader Joe was Joe Colombe. Back in the 1960s, Colombe was the owner of a Los Angeles, California-based chain of convenience stores called Pronto Markets. Then one day, he had an epiphany. He realized that most supermarkets were ignoring higher-educated, better-traveled consumers who wanted products that were a cut above your average supermarket fare. In 1967, Colombe opened the first Trader Joe's in Pasadena, California. Well, technically, he just converted one of his pronto markets and renamed it. According to CNN, the original store had a typical convenience shop assortment of groceries, along with discounted magazines, books, socks and hosiery, records, and photo finishing. The records they sold were presumably all sea shanties. Selling discounted magazines and socks doesn't exactly sound like sowing the seeds of greatness. But Cologne had a plan. And that plan was to sell booze by the boatload. Back then, California had laws that let liquor manufacturers set the minimum price of their products, which meant there was really no way for different outlets to compete on the basis of price. To make up for that, Trader Joe's decided to compete on the basis of selection, and they quickly became known for having the widest variety of alcohols in the world, including 100 brands of scotch, 50 brands of bourbon and gin, and 14 types of tequila. Colombe also eventually figured out how to game the system by importing high-end French wine that he was permitted to sell to his customers at a discount, thanks to some legal loophole. Gotta love those. This made Trader Joe's a popular spot with wine connoisseurs, a reputation it still holds today. Each Trader Joe's location sells roughly 400 different wines, around a quarter of which sell for $6 or less. The name Trader Joe's was selected to evoke a sense of international travel and was possibly inspired by the name of Trader Vic's, which is a chain of California tiki restaurants and bars that Cologne visited in college. If you're a rock and roll fan, you might recognize the name from the shout-out it received in the 1978 War on Zevon classic, Werewolves of London. In the line, I saw a werewolf drinking a pina colada at Trader Vic's. His hair was perfect. There's a lot going on in that lyric, so it's understandable if you missed the reference. Some alternate theories hold that the name was inspired by Disneyland's famous Jungle Cruise, or possibly a 1919 travel book by Frederick O'Brien called White Shadows in the South Seas. The first Trader Joe's was nautically themed and was decorated with things like fishing nets, half a rowboat, and a ship's bell. And rather than having a manager and assistant manager, the store had a captain and a first mate for people who want a little adventure in their kale. Over time, Cologne changed the supermarket business by buying products directly from manufacturers and selling foods from private labels to keep prices low. And the first Trader Joe's is still just where it's always been. In fact, it doesn't look all that different, although they've probably gone through a few captains since then. Trader Joe Cologne sold the company in 1979, but stayed on as CEO for another nine years. When he handed over the reins in 1988, the chain had 27 stores, all in California, and yearly sales of $150 million. After Cologne retired, a former fraternity brother of his from Stanford, named John Shields, took over as CEO. And Shields took the Trader Joe's brand national. The first ever non-California Trader Joe's opened its doors in Arizona in 1993. And by 1995, the chain had spread to the Pacific Northwest like a folk musician. Then locations began popping up in far-off lands like Chicago and Boston. 
Between 1990 and 2001 alone, the number of locations quintupled. By 2020, Trader Joe's has over 500 locations across the United States and does just under $17 billion a year in sales. Even Cologne himself was impressed, which, yeah, you kind of have to be, Joe. Of course, no story of Trader Joe's humble beginnings as a primo hooch parlor would be complete without two buck chuck. In 2002, Trader Joe's locations in California started selling wine under the Charles F. Shaw winery label. Big deal, the chain sells a lot of wine, right? But this variety was distinguished by the fact that it went at the incredibly, almost unbelievably, affordable price of just $1.99 a bottle. The product quickly became known among customers as Two Buck Chuck, and the company even adopted the nickname for their in-store branding. Two Buck Chuck became super popular, and by that we mean they sold 800 million bottles of the stuff between 2002 and 2013. You might imagine Charles F. Shaw would be proud to have his name attached to such a popular seller, but uh, he probably wouldn't be. Shaw, for the record, started his winery in 1974, after falling in love with wine on a trip to France. He didn't have any money, but he got a job at a bank just so he could afford the project. And things went pretty well, at first. According to Business Insider, he bought a vineyard in California and rolled out his first gamay, a type of Beaujolais, in 1979. He went on to win awards for the wine, which was also chosen to be served at three White House dinners. Despite the promise, however, and the label's actually pretty decent reputation, the wine, which cost the equivalent of about $57,2023 per bottle, was not a big seller. Then, in 1991, Shaw's divorce proceedings finally forced the winery into bankruptcy. Answer me! From which it was purchased by Fred Franzia's Bronco Wine Company. Franzia then decided to use the wine's respected label to push their cheap stuff. And to be honest, most of us already suspected the maker of Two Buck Chuck lost his winery in a divorce. Shaw isn't particularly thrilled to have his name be a synonym for the cheapest swill on the market, calling the experience embarrassing and demeaning. But he bounced back in the early 2000s and founded Orther Vineyard, which specializes in Riesling. As for Two Buck Chuck, it's still popular. And it's still called Two Buck Chuck, although it costs about $3.50 a bottle today. In the early 1970s, people suddenly decided that treating your body like crap was passe, and being healthy became all the rage. Eh, that's crazy. Well, since he was such a savvy businessman, Cologne quickly took note of the trend and realized it would probably appeal to the same people who bought upscale wine. In other words, his customers. He took steps to learn about the emerging health food scenes in Berkeley and San Francisco. And according to the man himself, I hired a young hippie woman out of the University of California at Santa Cruz to teach us the lingo. Because you can't sell people organic produce if they think you're an undercover cop. The results of those efforts would turn out to be Trader Joe's first private label product, granola. It was a hit, and the chain began adding other private label items like fresh squeezed orange juice, nuts, cheese, dried fruits, and vitamins. The healthy fare was so popular with consumers, it became a cornerstone of Trader Joe's business strategy, and a big part of its appeal to this day. Today, the store boasts that its private label brands are free of preservatives, artificial flavors, synthetic colors, artificial trans fats, and genetically modified ingredients. According to Joe Colomb's son, who is also named Joe, the private label products were the primary method by which his father was able to keep prices low without taking a hit on quality. Cologne figured out that by cutting out the middlemen and going directly to the product manufacturers, he could save a fortune. He began simply putting the name Trader Joe's on everything from Angus beef chili to organic dried mango to honey oat cereal, and people ate it up, literally. Eventually, he started naming products after family members, like his daughter Charlotte and Madeline. He started calling other things by even quirkier names, like Trader Darwin Vitamins, presumably named after his favorite naturalist and or X-Men character. Today, 80% of everything sold at Trader Joe's is their own private label brand. They never have sales promotions, discounts, coupons, or membership clubs, insisting that their low prices are basically like having a sale every day. Trader Joe's also has one of the most lenient return policies in the supermarket business, allowing you to return opened or even partially eaten purchases for a full refund. No questions asked. So just start saving your frozen pizza crusts in the box. However, if you're looking for something specific, you may need to look elsewhere. 
The average Trader Joe's only carries about 4,000 products at a time, as compared to your average supermarket, which carries somewhere in the area of 50,000 products. Despite their impressive expansion over the years, Trader Joe's still only does business in the United States. However, demand for their products across international borders has led to at least one interesting case of piracy, uh, technically. It all started when a San Francisco resident named Michael Halat fell in love with Trader Joe's private label products. But when he moved back to his hometown of Vancouver, he learned it was pretty much impossible to get any of those sweet TJ products. So Halat did what any hungry young man would do. He opened a specialty supermarket called Pirate Joe's. Pirate Joe's dealt exclusively in reselling products that had been purchased from Trader Joe's. This legally ambiguous business model proved to be extremely popular, and Pirate Joe's actually did a good amount of business. But given how much it was paying for its products in the first place, profit margins were extremely thin. The Trader Joe's people, for their part, eventually became concerned that people would confuse Pirate Joe's with the real thing and sued. They actually lost, with the judge ruling the violations of U.S. trademark law were outside the court's jurisdiction, since they occurred in Canada. But Trader Joe's appealed that ruling, and Halat didn't have the doubloons to afford to keep defending the suit. Pirate Joe's scuttled their ship for good in 2017. Yar. Joe Cologne passed away in February 2020 at the age of 89 having lived to see his creation become a massive nationwide success. Today, Trader Joe's is owned by the same family that partially owns Aldi supermarkets, but the two different brands are managed and maintained as completely separate companies. Trader Joe's now has over 560 locations in 42 states. That actually makes it bigger than Whole Foods. You know, the other upscale grocery store with too many SUVs in the parking lot. So what do you think? What's your favorite Trader Joe's product? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other Weird History Food videos.